we introduce the study of these religions by looking at three universal questions that everyone on earth asks. Why am I here? What's the meaning of life? What is the meaning of death? How can I find forgiveness? Or how do I deal with, the sh with my shortfalls? And we have looked at meta-narratives that interpret the answer to those questions within several different religious systems. Now I want to just review that a bit and make some comments then on what happens when the gospel meta-narrative walks across the page of these other meta-narratives, like Confucianism that we've just looked at. What happens when a Chinese Confucianist hears the gospel, hears the Christian meta-narrative? Um, so for a few minutes, I'd like to just pause and reflect on, on, that, on that question. It would be very interesting for us to break into small groups and discuss that question. It's a very important one. Uh, first, in regards to the African meta-narrative that uh, we talked about as an example of tribal religions around the world. And in regard to those three questions, the African meta-narrative within the context that I lived in and grew up in, in East Africa, said that there is a God who has created, but he has gone on a journey and he will never come back again. And therefore, we will be forgotten when we die. And so we need children to remember us. Because God has gone away, we need children who will remember us when we die. And therefore, it's very important to have as many children as possible. Everyone must get married because it's only through children who remember you when you die that your spirit will live on in the next life. Um, that's, the, that's, that's the narrative. And there's many, many stories about the God who went away and all of that sort of thing. Now, at Pumangi, where I grew up, I told you about being there about two years ago. And this very old woman walked into the church, about 700 people there, as we were singing and praising God. And uh, during a break in one of the choirs, this uh, crippled with arthritis woman held this book up in her hand, which was the Gospel of Matthew. And she said, this tells all about it. This is the good news. Believe this message of this book. Now, why did she say that? What did she see in the Gospel of Matthew that was very good news for her within her traditional meta-narrative. Why did she leave her traditional meta-narrative to embrace the gospel meta-narrative? What did she see? Well, she saw that God creates and that he did not go away, that he is with us. In fact, he is so concerned for us that he has come and walked among us. His name is Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Not only that, in his death and resurrection, he brings about the forgiveness of sins and the triumph over all evil powers. And so she knew that she was a forgiven woman by what Jesus had done for her on the cross, taking her place, a fulfillment of the sacrificial systems which permeate all African tribes and societies. Jesus is a fulfillment of that. And he promises to come back again and take us to be with him forever, resurrected life. And she doesn't need any children for that to happen. Um, it's God in Christ who rescues us from sin and who takes us into eternal life with him, resurrected life forever and ever. And that's why she was so happy that day in the church service and held up this little Gospel of Matthew that my father had been involved in translating back there many, many years before. And we could talk more about that. But I'm just trying to give a little window into each of these religions we've looked at and then ask the question, would the gospel be good news within that meta-narrative? Uh, if so, what would, what would the good news actually be? So I'd like to go now to the Hindu story that we talked about. And uh, maybe we'll limit the comments just to the Bhagavad Gita 
that narrative. What does it say about the question of why am I here and my destiny at death and forgiveness? What does it say, that Bhagavad Gita story where Arjuna is going to battle and uh, is very upset because he knows he'll be killing his cousins today. And he, his eyes are open to see that Krishna, his charioteer, is actually an avatar, an incarnation of the god Vishnu, and who's responsible for preserving the order of things. And Krishna informs him that your duty is to kill in this situation, because there's a war, you're a kshatriya, you need to kill. And in any event, the body is just an illusion, so you're actually not killing. You just think you're killing because you're only killing the illusion. Uh, you can't kill the Atman. The Atman is forever. You can't kill the, uh, the Brahman. That is forever. And Atman is Brahman and Brahman is Atman. And so even though you think you're killing, you actually aren't killing. All of that happens in that conversation there as they're going into battle. And of course, there's no forgiveness because that would upset the law of karma. You need to follow the law of karma. And that is the way in which you hopefully find a way to escape from this cycle of birth and rebirth that keeps going round and round and round. You want to get off that cycle. So follow the karma of your caste, worship any god you want to, and practice yoga so you come, become aware that you are one with the eternal um, and get, become absorbed into that eternal. That's basically the meta-narrative that we looked at in the Bhagavad Gita. We could look at the Upanishads and other meta-narratives in Hinduism as well, but they all basically agree with that story. And so now, uh, within that setting, within that worldview, within that meta-narrative, let's imagine Jesus walking across that page, someone who embraces the Bhagavad Gita, hearing the narrative of Jesus, uh, what does he hear? Is there something surprising? about Jesus, that he might say, wow, this is really a big surprise. And there certainly is. The, the Jesus narrative, the biblical narrative, says that this creation was created good and it's real. And we are created in God's own image. And it's, it's a real creation, a real person. We're created as real persons, you know. This isn't some sort of illusion, our, 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 our phenomenal lives here. No, it's real. And... Um, and God invites us to love our enemies, not to kill them, to love our enemies. And so we should turn away from acts of violence against our enemies and find a way to work peacefully at building relationships with one another. And in Jesus, we find forgiveness of sins. And so the law of karma is broken. We're freed from that. Forgiveness of sins is offered. And so the law of retribution is uh, it becomes a restoration invitation instead of retribution, a restoration, a restoration to a right relationship with one another and with God. And in what Jesus has done for us, we're promised eternal life. And so this wheel of going round and round and round, Jesus invites us to a new life with him eternally and a freedom from any wheels of any kind at all. Uh, we're freed from all of that to enjoy God e eternally in heaven with him in the resurrection. And so our destiny is not a wheel that goes round and round or absorption into some universal soul. No, our destiny is eternal personal life with God as we believe in him and accept the salvation that he offers. That would be basically the Christian meta narrative that, would, that, they, would, that they would see uh, and hear if someone were to offer a New Testament to someone who is uh, committed to the Bhagavad Gita understanding. Now, would he see that Christian message as good news? Uh, certainly, a lot of Indians do. I mentioned a number of times that across India today, uh, wherever you go, you hear accounts of very rapid growth of the church. And I think it's because the church narrative, the story of Jesus, is found to be very, very good news within that, that, within that setting. And it affects even such things as, uh, as the way in which we handle our fields and our farms, you know, because it's real, it's good, we're to develop it. And so economic development and all of that sort of thing become very much a part of what the biblical good news offers to people, invites people to participate in. Now, all of this is too short, too quick. I'm just trying to give sort of summaries of what we've talked about uh, together. 
and the name of this course is The Gospel in Lively <laughs> Encounter, a Lively Interaction with the World of Many Religions. What difference did Jesus make? And so I'm just probing that question a bit as we, uh, as we uh, move to other topics now. And uh, so then we think of Buddhism. And uh, Buddha says, well, it has no answer to the question of how this universe came to be. It's obviously an accident, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite unfortunate. But here it is. Uh, there's no creator God that one would refer to as you ask those questions about, about why we're here. Uh, but we know one thing, according to Buddhism, uh, the goal <laughs> is to get off this cycle of birth and rebirth that goes on and on and on. And so all of Buddhism is uh, attuned to attempting to find a way off of that cycle of birth and rebirth and, uh, and, uh, and, and to escape from suffering. That's the, that's the fixation of Buddhism, to escape from suffering, get away from it. And so you have those basic principles, the three, the three refuges of Buddhism that are offered to people to equip them to get off this cycle of rebirth and to escape uh, the reality of suffering. So that becomes the overall theme within Buddhism. And now imagine the gospel coming into that worldview, the story of Jesus being heard and shared. Um, what might a Buddhist find? Uh, why would it be that in Bangkok I meet with a former Buddhist monk who is baptizing 3,000 Buddhists a, year, uh, uh, a month who are coming to faith in Christ? What is it about Christ that they would find so attractive? Or Korea and so forth and so forth. What is it about the gospel story? Well, let's just listen to the gospel story as we think of it meeting a Buddhist worldview. The gospel story is that God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> it's not some unfortunate accident. No, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created the heavens and the earth good. And, but we've missed the way. We've turned away from God. We have the, the sinfulness that's become our experience, you know. And so we desperately need forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't a bad thing. It's a wonderful, wonderful gift of God's grace offered to us in Christ. And so the good news proclaiming that we are forgiven through what Christ has done for us, that the law of karma that, uh, that, that locks us into fate uh, is broken, for Jesus has died for our sins, the gift of forgiveness. As Paul Young Cho in Korea, I think I mentioned that the other day, why so many Buddhists in the city of Seoul are becoming Christians. And he says, just one word, forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. Uh, it's such very, very good news. And in the forgiveness of sins, Jesus offers us eternal life with him. So we are freed absolutely from any cycles and circles and all that sort of thing. But we are invited into, a, into an eternal resurrected life with him. Uh, it will be a bodily resurrection, the whole person resurrecting. And... Uh, and so, f and, and so uh, total freedom and release from all that would entrap us in this life as we participate in that resurrected life that is ours in Christ Jesus. And this world is real and wonderful, and so we should develop it and take it seriously and enjoy the fruits of creation and, you, and, and apply the skills that are needed to develop the good earth and so forth um, and, uh, and do so joyously. Um, and in freedom, knowing we're forgiven and released from all that our sinfulness might, uh, might bring our way. I think I, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. I think I mentioned to you that uh, when you fly into Seoul, Korea, uh, you see just hundreds and hundreds of red neon lights on the roofs all across that great city. It's a witness by the Christian community across that city that Jesus died for our sins, and in his death and resurrection, we are freed and forgiven. On the roofs of the houses, there's red neon lights speaking to the airplanes flying into the city at night. Amazing sight to see. <clears throat> and we talked about, um, about uh, faiths like Shintoism, or Shintoism, where, where divinity and nature and emperor and... Uh, People and the hills and the natural phenomenon are all divinity. There's no transcendent God who created all of this. It's all, all, it's all one. It, we call this the untocratic worldview. And that whole worldview which saw the king, the emperor, having come uh, 
uh, having been uh, the son of, uh, of divinities, of Shinto divinities, and, uh, and how this idea that we are a divine nation and so forth led this country progressively in the direction they eventually plunged it into World War II. What does the gospel say? What do they hear if the gospel comes into that setting as good news? And certainly, one dimension of the good news would be the announcement that we're created in God's image, but we're not God. <laughs> and we're accountable to God. We're not the final authority. Um, our emperor is not the final authority. Uh, God is the final authority. And God calls us to love our neighbors and to serve humanity and to, uh, and to live generously. And uh, we are not sort of spirits wandering here and there. Uh, we are human beings who Jesus uh, has come to redeem and to rescue and offers eternal resurrected life and a new community, fellowship with one another. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and our financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. What is the Confucian narrative? And uh, we talked about how Confucius uh, was uh, basically an agnostic. You would call him an atheist because he said there might be a god, there might be gods. He doubted it very much. But he was an agnostic, and he saw salvation coming through political means. Uh, I didn't mention it in our lecture today, but, uh, but uh, within, uh, within Confucian, for Confucius himself, he just invested his whole life in trying to put together a viable political system that would create manhood at its best. But he died a very discouraged man because he found that he was not able to put a good, perfect political system together that would create ideal people. He tried so hard, but he failed. I think uh, when the gospel, when the biblical worldview comes across that worldview, one thing the gospel does is to open our eyes to see that we're sinners and that political systems don't redeem us. They might be helpful, we work at them, we do our best to put them together, but at the end of the day, all political systems are flawed and none of us are manhood at his best. All of us in various ways fall short. And so the gift of forgiveness and new creation, which Christ offers, becomes very important. And uh, I think this is one reason for the very rapid growth of the church in China today, that this Confucian ethos with its political philosophy, which has much attraction to it in many ways, it doesn't really deal adequately with the problem of sin and ultimate destiny and so forth. And so the biblical story walks across modern day Chinese worldview and they're extremely intrigued about it. In fact, all over China today, in universities, you have these Bible clubs by universities, by, by professors in universities, who meet together with the Bible. They're not Christians. Some are Christians, but many are not Christians. But they're intrigued by the biblical message and what it has to say to the sorts of issues that a Confucian worldview raises. Um, and, uh, and of course, as also across China today, you're finding many persons who are finding in Christ an answer to that question of dealing with a problem of sinfulness and dealing with the question of destiny and what I'm here for, what it's all about. Uh, the biblical story of God in Christ walking among us and calling forth, offering new life and eternal life and, uh, and uh, a blessed relationship with God. Confucianism could never give a relationship with any divinity. They didn't believe in divinity. It's an agnostic philosophy. Same thing was true of Plato in Greece. Uh, he couldn't offer any relationship with the God. And I think that is one reason the philosophers were never really successful in catching the imagination of people as a whole, because people want a relationship. And when you introduce Jesus within a Confucian worldview, ah, oh, here's someone we can relate to. We can pray with Jesus. We can share with him. He becomes our friend. He walks with us. And so we're not alone in the journey of seeking to find the way forward. Well, those are some thoughts that come to my mind as I think of the religions we've been looking at and asking the question, when Jesus walks across the path, uh, 
is there, what is it about him that the persons might find inviting? That's a question. What does it mean? What difference does Jesus make in a world of many religions? And we've been trying to look at that as we move along through this class. And there's just a few summary, a few, a few summary comments.